And here we are with the great big golden uh, ball of fire which is in the, the sun, which we all adore, which we don't see enough of in this country. Uh, so I'm going to talk about sun and how it affects your skin, both good and bad. I'm not going to spend too much time on skin cancer, that's a whole other lecture in itself. We're going to talk about the sun, and before I do, we do have to uh, sort of uh, explain our, our associations and any conflicts of interest we may have with regards uh, to, to this lecture. And I would just like, my conflict of interest is that I am a dermatologist who loves the sun. <laughs> I know that's almost sinful, but I do love the sun. I grew up in Africa, I love the bright, I love the warmth, I love the fact you don't have to wear a lot of clothes. I love the way it makes you feel happy. I, way, I love the way you look slightly healthier if you've got a little bit of a sun-kissed look. The problem is trying to balance it all correctly. Uh, and being sensible uh, is difficult. As Granny used to say, everything in moderation is probably much better. But all we hear about is, you know, mustn't get any sun, or you must put on this, or you must avoid this, or you must go on the sunbeds to get your vitamin D. So there's a lot of myth and misunderstanding about things. And like all of these things, we don't have the right answers. All we have is some guidance. Um, so this is a picture of me. I'd like to point out I am wearing a hat, which does have a brim. I am wearing sunglasses, which are UVA and UVB resistant. I am wearing sun protection factor. That perfect um, uh, complexion that you're seeing there is due to the miracle of um, tinted moisturizer with sun protection factor. Um, it is a short sleeve shirt, but I did manage to cut the actual um, bit of that. So the first thing, what is the sun? We're going to talk a little bit about what actually the sun does. Okay, so there's a little bit of, of background on light and sun. The sun essentially, great big um, atomic bomb, neutron bomb going off in, in, in the universe, um, radiates a huge uh, array of different forms of um, radiation. And it's visible light, ultraviolet, infrared, x-rays, etc. So we're really interested from a skin point of view predominantly in the UVA, or the, the, sorry, the UV or ultraviolet light, and that is ultraviolet A, B, and C. C is for the most part screened off by the atmosphere, apart from where there are holes in the ozone layer, all right? Um, because UVC is, is extremely toxic. We wouldn't be able to survive if we were exposed to it. Then there's UVB, and UVB, the vast majority of UVB is actually screened off again by the atmosphere, but a proportion of it gets through. Um, things like air pollution, clouds, etc. That can all alter it. And then an awful lot of UVA comes through the, comes through the, the atmosphere. Um, and UVA and UVB are the two that we're going to really um, concentrate on. Easy way to remember it, though it's not solely true, is UVA ages, UVB burns. That's the simple way to remember it, but it isn't only that. They have lots of different um, uh, problems. So, the first thing I want you to be aware of is the importance of where you are in the world and the season you're in in the world. If you think about it, um, the sun's radiation and it's coming straight at the equator. Okay, it's a bit like a, a bit like a la, uh, sort of a torch if you think about it. If you look at that, you know, and you and you shine it straight up at the at the at the uh, ceiling, you'll see that all of the beam is concentrated in a small area. Now, if you think as we go around the world and you get further and further away you can see how diffuse. It's the same amount of light, same amount of energy, all coming in, but it's much more diffused. So nearer the poles, you get less concentrated light than you do at the equator. So if you live nearer the equator, or you holiday nearer the equator, you're going to get more increased concentration of sun's radiation. And that's visible light and the UV radiation as well. If we live further nearer the poles, so for example in Ireland, we get lower concentrations because of the angle that the light is hitting the Earth. Now, of course, that changes because what happens? The sun tilts, or the Earth tilts. So, for example, this is one that's sort of like in the middle of the year. Uh, you can see the red is the highest uh, concentration of, of radiation coming through the, the, the uh, atmosphere. And you can see it's very high in certain areas all around the equator. Now, you may ask, why on Earth, for example, here on the equator, isn't it higher? Because there are clouds in the Amazon. And so the UV radiation is getting through is lower. Um, if you look up here, for example, it's much higher than you would expect. And that's because these are all mountainous regions. So you're closer to the sun. So the height that you're at, where you are near uh, the equator, etc., is important. And then, of course, as the Earth tilts, here this is in January, so in the middle of winter, 
and this is um, in June. You can see that here the radiation levels are much higher in the southern hemisphere, and as the Earth tilts, the radiation increases. So here, for example, here's Ireland up here. We're getting really low levels of, of radiation during the winter, but that all increases as the Earth tilts and we go into the summer. So the time is very important with regard to season. It's also important with regard to the time of day. Um, and this, for example, just looks at you know, four days, and this is a UV index in Dublin, and you can see that your UV radiation is usually high between 11 and 3, whereas in the morning and the evening, it's not as high. All right? So your time of day, your time um, of the year, and your geographical position, both within the Earth and the height, is very important. And that's where the, knowing what happens there means that you can plan how you're going to look after your skin during the, with the sun. All right? And then the, final, the other thing I want you to be aware of is reflection. Um, and reflect at the UV radiation and light, etc., we all know is reflected off surfaces. So up as far as 80% off snow, 20% off water, 10% off sand and concrete, and about 1% off the grass. So you may be sitting under that sun umbrella, thinking you're safe, but you're still getting some reflected radiation. So it's just a, an awareness of that. So just to summarize all of this, your, your UV radiation will come through. It has to get through the ozone layer first, then it has to get through the atmosphere, the clouds, pollution, etc., and then it hits our skin. So what does it do on our skin? What does the, 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 the UV radiation do? Well, we know visible light, for example, hits our skin and fine, and a lot of it goes through. We can, that's why you can shine a light through your hand and you'll actually you'll see some of the light. Um, so the skin and how it reacts in both good and bad ways to the sun and how important the sun is to being alive is very important. But again, it is about watching the amount you get. So for those of you who... Um, just to, to recap on the skin, there's the, this layer up here is called the epidermis. It's the upper layer of the skin, and then this is the dermis. The epidermis essentially is our waterproof barrier almost. Um, and this is the bit that sort of protects us from friction, it protects us from um, scratching, it protects us from uh, uh, insects and the entrance of, 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 of things that cause disease. And then our dermis is full of magnificent um, uh, organs and... and, and uh, factors which, which are, are, are important um, uh, within our actual ability to live uh, as beings on this earth. So we have things like hair follicles, we have oil glands, we have our blood, we have lots of things, we have nerves, etc. And the area we're going to concentrate really is here between the epidermis and the dermis, what's called the dermo-epidermal junction. Okay? It's essentially where your top layer of your skin is velcroed onto the bottom and mid layer of the skin. And the reason for that is the cells that we're really interested are here. They're called melanocytes. And melanocytes are essentially your tanning cells. And melanocytes produce melanin. That's what makes you look tanned. Um, and it is our natural protective sunscreen. So, for example, people who are darker skinned have more melanin than um, people who are paler skinned. They also have a different type, but it's predominantly, it's, it's actually the concentration of melanin that's important. We all have about the same number of tanning cells, but some of them function a lot better than, um, than other people. And what happens, the easiest way to think about it, is that about one in every 15 cells along this dermo-epidermal junction here is a little tanning cell or melanocyte. And it sits there, and when the UV radiation hits it, it starts to produce melanin. Essentially, it's trying to protect yourself. And it feeds these little packages of melanin out along these sort of um, arms that it has in between to each one of these cells. So for example, this is a, a melanocyte, a rather lovely photograph of a melanocyte. You can see it almost looks like a little octopus with all of these tentacles reaching in between different cells. And it's making this melanin, these little melanosomes containing melanin, and it's feeding them out along those arms essentially making a production line um, so it, it feeds out to the cells to protect them. Sorry, I keep going back. So what happens then, of course, is melanocytes form almost a network of protection over your, over your skin. All right? Melanocytes don't actually like being together. They actually spread out, um, except when, of course, they form moles. But we'll talk a little bit about that. So you've got a network of this protective layer um, th through, throughout your skin. And uh, it varies throughout the skin. 
And we know, for example, that the intensity of that network or the color of that network also varies because we have so many different forms of skin color. We have darker, we have paler, we have redheads, we have blondes, etc. We have a large number of different colors. And even amongst a particular color, for example, there will be a, a difference in color. So, for example, if you're in a, in a group of, of um, people from Africa, you'll know that some of them are brown, some of them are almost garnet, some of them are sort of a greenish black. And there's the whole variation, and that's because each one of us has a different amount of these uh, of melanin and a different, different mixture of it. As dermatologists, we've divided it essentially into five different skin types. All right, so we have, and again, that depends on what it does. So we have our redhead here, um, which is uh, essentially type one. So always burns and never tans. Type two is always burns, sometimes tans. Type three, sometimes burns, always tans, four and five. Most Irish people think they're three, okay? But in fact, most Irish people, or Celtic people, I should say, are one and two. And it's really how your skin reacts, an unexposed skin reacts to the midday sun is the important thing. How fast will you burn? Uh, so most people are type one or two if they're of Celtic origin. And of course, we know that the darker skin um, won't uh, be able, or we say that they, they won't burn, but in fact you do. The darker skins do burn but it's much more difficult to burn. They need an awful lot more radiation. So what happens when the sun, sun's radiation hits our skin? Well, again, we go back to the UVB and UVA. And UVB doesn't penetrate the skin particularly far. So it's really just the upper layers of the skin. UVA does penetrate very deeply. Um, so the difference in, in their, the, the effect is quite marked. And until recently, we really always thought it was UVB that was the bad thing. But in fact, UVA has also been shown to be very important um, in a lot of different uh, forms of skin conditions. So what happens when the radiation comes in? Of course, what happens? You get a burn, sunburn, all right? And you get these things called sunburn cells. You get damage to the cells. They begin to break up. Um, you get this thickening in the skin. That's why people who tan have very thick-looking skin. Uh, it's desperately trying to protect itself. Um, and then you stimulate your melanocytes. You're stimulating your, um, your production of your, your natural sunscreen, if you like. So what is melanin? Melanin is essentially is the skin's sun umbrella or sun hat. Um, so if you look along here, for example, you can see that in each one of these little sort of darkish orangey areas, that's there. It's taken this melanin and it's popped it over the nucleus, the most important package within your cell, to protect your DNA. It's trying to protect that and it absorbs any of the radiation that comes through. This is a lovely photograph. This is a person who's tanned. Okay, you can see those are your melanocytes and they're feeding all of that melanin in there and you know, it's all, you're all tanned here. Look at that thick skin there. So this is the tans and the skin is constantly turning over. Um, so it's constantly having to, 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 to reprotect itself. Um, so again, just to make that point that it's actually sitting around your nucleus, which is where the most important part of your, of your cells are, your DNA, so that they can constantly um, turn over and grow new skin. So that's what your, your tan or your, your uh, melanocyte does. So how do you get sun exposed? And there's really just, it's fairly simple. It's either acute or chronic. In other words, you suddenly get some, or it's something that you get a little bit every single day. So your acute one, of course, is the holidays, what I like to call the Ryanair effect. And then the summer days, and in this country, we don't get enough of them, so they tend to come along a little bit surprisingly, and when we get them, we run out and we enjoy the sun. So we get, it, we get that sort of episodic exposure, and that's acute. Then we have our chronic um, sun exposure, and those are people who are getting a little bit of radiation every single day. They work outdoors, they're golfers, they're gardeners, uh, they're walkers, etc. And then, of course, chronic as well, places of habitation. If you live in Australia, if you live near the equator, you're going to get a little bit more sun every day than if you're somebody, uh, you know, who lives in Ireland. And when I say sun, I'm talking about UV radiation. Um, so it is important. And I often say to people, you know, people say, but I, 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 I don't sunbathe. Um, and it's important to realise that actually it's, you're getting a little bit every single day. A little bit. Um, it's like if you smoked one cigarette a day. After 40 years, would you be surprised if you had a cough or a wheeze? You wouldn't. And it's exactly the same with the sun. If you get a little bit every day, are you going to be surprised that you're getting some changes associated with the sun? No. So what types of exposure again? 
intentional. That's, yahoo, I'm here in Ibiza, let's lie down for the next five hours and get a tan. And I'm here for a week and I'm going back mahogany. That's not, that's really the way that we can start to change people's um, behavior, is that to try and make that unfashionable. And it is beginning to work now. That mahogany tan is no longer acceptable. But this is the most common form that, that causes problems, it, unintentional. And that's the accidental exposure. Suddenly it became a nice day and you sat out and had lunch in the park, but it was an hour and a half and you didn't have your hat and you didn't have your sun protection. Or you're going out and something happens and you stay along. I have a patient, for example, who gave me a wonderful, she came into me and she was burnt and she'd had a history of melanoma. And um, she said that she'd had friends in and they were sitting under the, the um, umbrella and they were really good and everything was, was, was fine. And then she went to say goodbye to them and she stood at the door and an unusual Irish goodbye. It took her 20 minutes for her to say goodbye and for everyone to leave. She was standing outside saying goodbye to them and she burnt. Um, so it's accidental. Um, and then, of course, there's the unknown, when we don't think we're getting any. So on a cloudy day, you're going to get some radiation. Or you got the reflection, as I said, off the water, or off the sand, or off the concrete. So those are the type of risks. Uh, we know this, for example. We, we've, we've all been here, I think, would be the honest thing. We have all been here. This is a sunburn. Um, and uh, this is the acute reaction of the skin. But what about the chronic reaction that we get when you're exposed to the sun? Well, here's freckling, again, a normal variation. It's just, it, it's something that occurs. You'll see it, for example, you very rarely see infants or babies with freckles. Why? Because it's something that, you know, you, you develop as you get sun exposure with a genetic component associated with it. As you get older, of course, you get more and more, and we all see these freckles, you know, there's probably nobody over the age of 25 who doesn't have something on the back of their hands. Um, and they, you know, these are called liver spots, but they've got nothing to do with your liver. It's because they're sort of the color of liver. Um, certainly if it was cooked by me, it would certainly look that color. Um, but these are little lentigines. So these are freckles that don't go away. Freckles come and go with the sun. Lentigines stay there all the time. And then this is, for example, melasma. And we see this in pregnant women. And we see it in people who are on the oral contraceptive pill, or it can just occur. And if you expose yourself to the sun, it can make it much more obvious. Um, and this is pigmentation. And again, uh, not such a huge problem, very pale um, uh, skin that's not exposed to the sun, but it is a huge cosmetic problem in darker skins because it has such an impact. And then there's simple things. This is a little thing called poikiloderma civat. You can see the cutoff point here. This man lived in Australia for years. He was a businessman and he always wears, wore a shirt and tie. Um, so he had the protection there. But you can see that sort of rough cobblestone, slightly irregularly pigmented discoloration. And again, it usually spares that area there just under your, your chin there. And that's again because of shadow um, from your chin. So this is something that we very commonly see. And then, of course, you get this dispigmentation or irregular pigmentation. And irregular pigmentation, even from a cosmetic point of view, adds 10 years to a person's perception of how old you are. So that's why all of these, that's why makeup is so important to make you look younger. It evens out your complexion. It's why facial peels, that's why all of these sort of rejuvenating procedures are about making your, 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 your pigmentation more even. Because an irregular pigmentation um, does, uh, does show that you've, you've aged. Um, and here, for example, again, you can see the difference between the, the skin on this gentleman, where it's exposed and where it's not exposed because he always wore a top. And you could see how wrinkled it is and how saggy and how rough and how, um, uh, w what a different pigmentation it has. And aging, 70% of aging is as a result of sun exposure, all right? Um, so here we get this sort of waxy yellow discoloration, all right? Uh, you can see it closer closer there. Um, and that's part of normal skin aging, as are wrinkles. And you get these sort of wrinkles that aren't associated with movement. Any of the wrinkles that you see along there or up there, they're movement wrinkles. And that's what Botox works on, for example. Um, you, can, uh, you can certainly improve those. But um, it's these cross-hatching wrinkles that don't follow movement. Those are the ones that are as a result of damage to your skin. And that's because of damage to elastin and collagen and you're thinning your skin. I often say it's like if you have you know, one of those great Lycra t-shirts. That's your Lycra t-shirt. It's new. You're 15. It's fabulous. But if you constantly wash it and stretch it and it's out in the sun and it's not treated very well, what's going to happen? It's going to get saggy and it's not going to have the same you know, color, etc. So that is, that's what you're doing to your skin uh, unless you take care of it. Now, of course, it's going to happen anyway. Every t-shirt gets baggy eventually, 
but um, essentially, you know, you, there are ways you can, you can look after it. And then just to talk about some of the other things, and this is a, an area men tend to forget about. We start to thin, um, you know, in our 20s, 30s and 40s. I know it's still there, a bit like me, it's still a little bit there. I'll be fine. But in fact, you do need to protect it because we don't have the protection that um, the hair will offer. So we get a lot of irregular pigmentation. And one of the commonest sort of, sort of da warning signs that you have sufficient damage are these things called actinic keratoses. You see here, they're sort of slight rough, slightly scaly, sandpapery feel, and they're on any sun-exposed site. This is a really good photograph of just to show you what the sun does. This gentleman was a truck driver, and he drove for decades as a truck driver. Guess which side was exposed to the sun? All right, so that just shows you um, what the sun itself will do. We'll talk a little bit about moles and a tiny little bit about skin cancer, but not an awful lot because that's an entire lecture in itself. But moles are normal, okay? Moles are normal. And what are moles? These little dark cells you hear, all these little black dots, these are all your tanning cells. And what happens is some of those uh, tanning cells clump together to call what we call a nest. So the medical word for a mole, for example, is nevus, which means nest. Uh, and a mole is just a collection of these tanning cells. And they can be flat, or they can be raised, or they can be brown, they can be black, they can be blue, they can be skin colored. They're just a little clump together of cells. And so here, for example, you see a nice flat one. And a normal mole, and remember the body loves symmetry. We grow two arms, two legs, two eyes, two ears. We love symmetry. We try to achieve symmetry. So a nice, even, symmetrical mole is normal. Now the body isn't perfect, some of our ears are a little less symmetrical. Some of us have one leg shorter than the other. So it's a little bit of asymmetry is certainly okay uh, in a mole. So for example, you see this mole here, it's slightly asymmetrical, but that's all really. And it's been constant like that. So that's what a mole is. And you can either inherit them, you're born with them, what's called a congenital mole. And that's usually within the first, uh, you're, you're born with them or within the first two years, you can get a, a form. And then they're acquired moles, all right? And we'll talk a little bit about that. It's a combination of genetic, your mother is to blame, or your father, uh, and sun exposure. So the combination of the two of those are important. It's a really complex um, system that we don't actually fully understand why some people get moles and why some people don't. Uh, but we do know, for example, that you can get them rapidly after a, a bad sunburn or after a blistering burn from the, you know, the iron or the cooker or after some drug um, eruptions that are very severe. And with some um, skin conditions, you can get them if you blister badly. So it's a combination of these two factors. And this is where the, the um, difference is noticeable when we start to look after our children and make sure that they are protected from the sun. These are both the same age. These backs are both the same age. The one here, one congenital mole. He was born with that mole. Absolutely perfect. This is an 18-year-old boy. Man, I should say. This is an 18-year-old girl. And she has had lots of sun holidays. And she has been out and tanning, etc. And you can see the amount of moles that she has grown as a result of that. Uh, so this is the perfect skin, if we can possibly, as a dermatologist, lovely sort of alabaster skin. And this is what happens. So very, very unusual uh, you know, difference there. And the reason that I'm showing you this is to drive home the point that we get the vast majority of our sun exposure during the first 20 years of our life. So that's the time when we have the most chance of reducing our sun exposure. We get this sort of, you know, it's quite normal to have a few moles. Most people have, you know, between 10 to 20 moles. That's quite normal. Um, and again, as I said, we sort of grow the same type of moles. We, we, we grow a certain pattern and everybody's pattern is different. And that then leads us on to skin cancer. And there are actually a hundred or more different forms of skin cancer. Anything within the skin can become cancerous. But the three commonest forms are basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and malignant melanoma. Basal cell and squamous cell together combined are almost one third of all cancers in Ireland, but they very rarely kill. Malignant melanoma can kill, particularly, particularly if it's caught late. Um, and this is where we, we, we drive all our, our resources to try and improve things. But this is a massive amount of workload. Um, and it is the skin cancer generally is the fastest growing um, cancer in Ireland and will continue 
to grow year on year. And because remember, there's a lag period. We're all sitting here and we all got sun uh, as we were you know, in our 20s and in our 30s. And that's gonna, we're going to start paying for that in our 50s and our 60s and our 70s because skin cancer is much more common in the older generation. So what is a basal cell carcinoma? It's also called a rodent ulcer. They're these little sort of raised, rolled edges with a little central ulceration in them that just isn't healing. They can be shiny patches. You know, they can be just little lumps and bumps, okay? But again, you know, they're growing. They're slowly growing, but they're growing. And these don't spread anywhere. They don't go to your lungs or your liver or anything. They don't, you know, cause problems like other cancers. They just grow locally. They're called a rodent ulcer because if you left it there long enough, it just eats away at the skin. And it's just like a rat would eat away at your face. I don't have a picture of that. Well, I do, but I'm not going to show it because you'd all leave the room. Squamous cell carcinoma, again, very common. Um, and these are just like slowly growing areas of, of ulceration or erosion within the skin or scaly patches or little lumps and bumps. And again, the basal cells and squamous cells usually are in chronic sun exposed. So your face, your hands, etc. But they can occur anywhere. And then, of course, there's melanoma. And the melanoma is the asymmetrical, irregular, changing mole. Um, or new mole that is changing. And here you can see that isn't symmetrical. It's not regularly pigmented. It's very irregular edge. This isn't something that your body wants to grow. Here's another one, for example, very subtle and very early, but this was a new change in an old mole uh, where you get this little dark lump. And you see, you can't really draw a line down this and make it symmetrical. Um, so, and then here, there's, there's a form that we get as we get older called lentigo maligna that can be present for decades before it becomes nasty. So what do you look for? This is just my public education things. The A, B, C, D, E, F. A, asymmetry. You, one half does not look like the other. B, the border is very irregular, not symmetrical. It's very irregular. C, many colors, usually more than three. D, diameter. Bigger than a shirt button is bad. Not always, but that's an easy way to remember it. E, evolving, a changing mole. This, the far one here, these were all her normal moles, and this was a new one that was developing. So we managed to pick that one up. And then funny looking, okay? Or what we call the ugly duckling. It's not like the rest of your moles. It's not like something that, you know, has been there, and it's changing and it's altering. So those are the things you look for. A, B, C, D, E, F. So how do you protect yourself? I'm putting this in big, let's hear, avoid the high times of radiation. Between 11 and 3, remember the slide about Dublin? And May and September, remember the earth tilt. Seek out the shade if at all possible, particularly during those times. Cover up. Long sleeves, long trousers, you know, the Victorians had the right idea. Long flowing sort of silk and, and, um, uh, and uh, linen, etc. Uh, hats with a broad brim. A cap is better than nothing, but a hat with a broad brim is much more important. Sunglasses, preferably wrap around and make sure that they are UV and UVB resistant and they're not just coloured glass. And then the last thing you do is your sun protection factor. All right, it's the last thing you do. And unfortunately, whenever, whenever you talk to somebody about sun, uh, sun protection, they immediately think of sun protection factor creams. But it's in fact the last thing you should be doing. So, there's, this is just uh, to show you, you know, to, to, to drive home the point that a white t-shirt, a normal white t-shirt has a sun protection factor equivalent of seven when it's dry, two when it's wet. But it has a persistent sun protection factor. So in other words, you don't, it doesn't wear off during the day. You don't sweat it off. And that's why we advise people to cover up. You get this persistent um, uh, sun protection factor. But just to be aware that you can still burn if you're wearing a white t-shirt. The best fabric for sun protection is denim. But I'd like to see anybody wear denim if they're in the middle of the Caribbean or on a summer's day. This gentleman has sort of the right idea. It's just such a pity he doesn't have a, bro a broad brimmed hat. But it's better than nothing. So how do they work? There's two types. One is a chemical, um, and these are the names that you'll see on, the, on, the, on the, the bottles, for example. But they need time to absorb. And that's why we tell people you need to put them on about 20 minutes beforehand, 20 minutes to half an hour. They need time to be absorbed into the skin. And then there's the barriers, and the barriers are the ones that work immediately, essentially titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. And if you think about these, these are almost like hundreds of thousands of tiny mirrors, and they're reflecting the light back, the barriers. That's why they look white. Okay, that's why they that'll make you look white. The chemical ones are a lot more cosmetically acceptable. They won't make you look as white, but they do need time. And the other thing is that they do wear off and you do sweat them off. And they need to be UVA and UVB. We used to, when we talk about an SPF, 
we're referring only to the UVB in the past, and we only had UVB protection, whereas now it has to be combined UVA, UVB, and they try to link the two. They have to have a certain level of UVA protection. But when you're talking about an SPF factor, it's about the UVB protection. The other thing is you need to apply enough, okay? A shot glass for the body, a teaspoon for the face. And you need to do it often enough. So about 20 minutes before you're exposed to the sun, and then apply every two hours or so, okay? The reality is we only usually apply about a third the amount that we, you know, we should apply. And that's why dermatologists push for higher factors to be used because you will then get a sufficient factor. And the other thing, of course, is applying it evenly enough. We always forget the back of our knees, our ankles, behind the ears. There's always somewhere that you forget. Um, and that's why, again, we're now pushing to apply twice initially. It's just to, uh, if you apply half the amount you need, you don't decrease the sun protection factor by half, you increase it by 75%. So if you put on a factor 30, you're probably getting about a 10 or so, 10 to 12, okay? And that's why we talk about a double coat. You apply one coat of sunscreen, wait for 20 minutes, and then apply a second coat. And that's to try and get all the areas that you miss. <coughs> Easiest way to remember the amount of, that you get a golf ball size for the body and a teaspoon for the face, all right? That's, again, uh, another way. So what level of factor should you use? Well, look at the difference here. SPF 15 93% of UVB is screened out, 30, 97, 50, 98. So there isn't a huge difference between a 15 and a 50. The difficulty, of course, is how we apply it. So when we're putting on a 50 or a 30, we're not getting that unless we, we, we actually apply it correctly. You can see, so the, the higher and higher, so factor 100, why bother? Okay, factor 2000, as it was in that sci-fi film, not gonna make that much difference. Um, but always check as well the UVA and protection that it has, and it should be fairly closely linked. Things that remove your sunblock, rubbing, sweating, swimming, chlorine in the pool, salt in the ocean, putting on your sun protection factor, lying on the towel, getting up, turning over, it's all on the towel, it's not on you. Water resistant, to be able to be called water resistant, it should last for up to 40 minutes in water. That's, what it, 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 that, that's the, the, the requirement for something to be called water resistant. There is no all day sunscreen, unless it's a tent, all right? So there is no once a day sunscreen, full stop. They degrade in light, in UVR, and they degrade in heat. So the sunscreen that you've had in the car for the last year probably isn't working as well as it should. And this is why you need to apply. So if you wait two and a half hours to apply the sunscreen, you've five times higher a chance of burning than someone who reapplies it every two hours. Right? Nice little study that showed that. So even just waiting that 30 minutes. And of course, mum is always the last one to actually apply the sun protection factor onto herself after she's, um, she has applied it on everyone else. So she's probably the one that's going to burn. So enough about the bad news about the sun. What about the good news about the sun? Vitamin D, all right, very quickly. Vitamin D is made in our skin. We, in, we take it into our diet and it's made in our skin. Um, so when this UVB radiation, so it's when UVB radiation hits the skin, um, we get this vitamin D precursor, and that then goes to the liver and then to the kidneys and then uh, goes around the body. It's a very complex um, series of, uh, of um, chemical reactions within the body. Sorry. Um, what does vitamin D do for the, skin, uh, for the body? Well, it helps in the absorption of calcium, necessary for the absorption of calcium from, um, from your diet. Um, if you don't have enough of it, rickets, for example. Now, you know there have been a lot of things about, oh, we're not getting enough vitamin D, and rickets is on the rise again, etc., etc. And really, rickets and, and vitamin D were a problem um, previously because we're now clothed. We used to be naked. We now live in cities where there's pollution, so we're getting less UVB. And we're working indoors, or children are indoors a lot more. So, rickets in the 19th century was a big problem, not such a big problem now because of our diet has improved. But it can lead to problems and exacerbate problems such as osteoporosis later in life. But the important thing about vitamin D, and we're still discovering what, how important vitamin D is, is it's used in thousands of different biological um, uh, processes within the body. And the more research that is done, it seems to be linked to a whole variety of different of disorders. 
multiple sclerosis, for example. If you um, have a low vitamin D level, you're more likely to develop multiple sclerosis. Um, if you have a risk factors, diabetes, it's been shown in, arthritis, even, even high blood pressure, it's been linked to. But these are all very early. It's not definite yet. It looks like there may be a link. Similarly with cancer, similarly with your um, immune system. So it is the type of thing that we yet don't know the advice we should give people about vitamin D, apart from make sure you're getting enough. Because we don't know um, exactly what it, its role is as yet. But it will become clear over the next few years. And one of the, 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 this is just to remind me of a lovely study that looked at surfers and lifeguards in Hawaii. And they found that the lifeguards who were out and about in the sun had higher vitamin D levels than the surfers who were also out in the sun. And we, we couldn't understand this. And interestingly, the vast majority of them, although they were all white and it was in Hawaii and they were out all the time, had low vitamin D levels. We know primates get their vitamin D. They can't, of course, get it from their skin because their fur is stopping it. They get their vitamin D because they're grooming other primates. And the sebum comes off on their, their paws and they lick it. So that's how they get their vitamin D. We don't know where in the human skin as yet exactly that vi vi where vitamin D is made. With its cholesterol or fat dissolvable, so it's probably somewhere in the upper skin. But this led to the thought that possibly it's so, so high up in the skin that it needs time to absorb. And we know, for example, it takes a day to two for the change in vitamin D from exposure to the sun to a rise in your vitamin D level. And that's because we think vitamin D may have to travel through the skin. And the theory behind the difference between the surfers and the lifeguards were the lifeguards didn't get into the water. They were watching. The surfers were in and out of the water. So what was happening? They were washing the vitamin D off that they were making. So that's one possible explanation. We still don't know the full answer, but that's just to make the point that vitamin D is very complex and nobody will give you a definitive advice on it. Where can you get your vitamin D? Of course, the sun, but also fortified milk. It's in a lot of our milks, our cheese, butter, margarine, all of these things that are bad for your, your arteries, unfortunately, or good for, your, good for other things. Um, healthy cereals, not Cocoa Pops, um, and oily fish, all right? And honestly, if you're not sure, just take a pill, is what we normally say to people. There are so many vitamin supplements, you know, and, we, and the exact amount, again, is difficult to answer. And then two things, your sun makes you feel better. The lack of sun makes you feel a bit depressed. Why is that? Because we are diurnal and circular, cir circadian um, beings. Our brain and our hormones and our biological processes follow a normal night-day cycle. We're great in the mornings, okay, some of us are better than others, um, and we're not so good at night. And this is all down to a, uh, a pathway, the serotonin-melatonin pathway. Um, serotonin is the happy sort of hormone, if you like, the happy, the, the happy chem chemical uh, that makes you feel better. Um, melatonin is what puts you to sleep. When it's dark outside, your melatonin production increases, and that's what makes you go to sleep. And of course, we as, as, as uh, uh, modern beings are now, you know, uh, up a lot later and we're under artificial lights. So we're altering that melatonin-serotonin balance. Uh, but what the sun does, and this is where we think seasonal affective disorder, uh, mood changes, etc., the light coming into your eye, and this is visible light, um, will activate via the uh, pineal gland what's called the third eye, if you like, that's what the third eye is based on, and it increases the, the production of um, your feel-good hormone, serotonin. And when the light goes dim, the melatonin begins to kick in. So again, it's that normal cycle. So I think really the take home point about what to do with your sun protection and your exposure to the sun is actually just balance. A little bit of sun's not bad, a bit too much sun is, is bad. So it's just about learning to balance things and getting everything in moderation and being sensible with your sun, but also learning 
what your skin is about and how you actually should check your skin regularly. Those are important lessons to learn. And the most important thing is, do remember that, you know, we all love the sun. And I bang on about sun protection factor, etc., etc. But, you know, I don't really 100% listen to myself all the time. This is on a family holiday, and you can see half the family are completely ignoring me down here. Luckily, my mother and I are sort of in the shade. I don't know if you can see it, but the only person who's actually listened to me is the dog. <laughs> Thank you very much.